What do you think of when you think of God's punishment toward mankind? Do you think of his love? Do you think of his wrath? Do you think of his mercy? Do you think of his vengeance? How do you define God's punishment? Is it fair? Is it just? Is it petty or vindictive? This is something that obviously Christians and atheists do not agree on. In fact, this is even something many Christians can't agree on. Is it God's sovereignty that is essentially saying he can do whatever he wants and still remain a good and just God? Or are God's punishments always just? Are they just because he does them? Or are they just because it aligns with the moral law that he has given? These kinds of questions can be endless, and I have used God's unjust, and unfair wrath and punishment as the topic of many of my videos. But I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to go ahead and just concede the fact. Let's go ahead and assume, I will get on board for this video, that this God is a God that is so glorious, that is so perfect, that despite the argument if he created evil or not, or suffering or not, or we have free will or not, let's just really assume he has to punish, how then would you expect this God to go about it in terms of his attitude toward it? Would you expect him to be happy about it? Would you expect him to boast about it? Would you expect him to laugh about it? Would you expect him to delight in destruction? I think if we're honest, I think most believers would say no. We would expect that this God is sad, that he mourns over those he loses, that he almost has to regretfully carry out these punishments but he has to be just. Wicked has to be accounted for. It is with a heavy heart that this God doles out justice. It is with sorrow. And so that's the point of today's video. We have verses that back up those kinds of claims that I just made, and I'm going to start with those. But then we have a lot of verses that show a God that revels in his violence, that enjoys the comeuppance. So this will be another episode in the playlist of Let the Bible Refute Itself, where I only use the word of God to counter the word of God. By the way, I'm Brandon. The channel here is MindShift. Thank you for being here. If you like these kinds of videos, please make sure you subscribe, leave a comment, turn on notifications, share, do all the things. Without further ado, let's first talk about the verses in God's favor. Now, there's plenty. I'm only going to give you a couple here because they show a pattern. In Ezekiel 33 11, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you all die? people of Israel. In Psalm 86, 15, we get, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And in Hosea 11, 8, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. So, before you hit me in the comments with all the verses that show this God as loving and compassionate and merciful and slow to anger and regretful in his duty as the arbiter of justice, I would like to say I acknowledge them, but there is one thing they all have in common. It is only when God is speaking to Israel, his chosen people. And yet, I will read you verses today where God is also speaking to his chosen people, Israel, where he is delighting in their destruction, as well as plenty of verses when he is talking to the nations around Israel or the Gentiles. However you want to look at this, we have contradictions in God's nature, and it is not cherry picking for me to provide the ones to you that show that what believers often quote about this God of love and mercy and just punishment is simply not the case. Last caveat, and then we'll get right into all the verses that I've prepared for you. I'm not going to be giving any examples from the New Testament. I had planned to, I had written many down, but it seemed to be going off in its own topic. And that's because the punishments as described in the New Testament are primarily punishments for the afterlife. And I already have a couple videos about hell and if it's just or not. I know there's topics of conversation about universalism or annihilation, and those are all going to be for later. The fact of the matter is, is we also have a claim from God that he never changes. So you should still believe that the God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament, and thus the character of the God of the Old Testament matters. And the God of the Old Testament does doesn't punish in the next life. He punishes in this life. And the ultimate punishment in the Old Testament is a loss of life, death, because there weren't these concepts of heaven and hell baked in. Don't worry, God was plenty creative and he often just used torture or slavery or rape or general harm of a multitude of different kinds to inflict punishment as well. That must have been him being merciful since he didn't always make it lead to death. I'm well aware that all the verses I'm going to use today are from the Old Testament, and that is why. We can talk about the punishment of the New Testament, aka hell, more in depth with more future videos. So let's dive right in. Some of these verses we'll talk about quite a bit, and some we will just let lie. Let's start with Deut 28, 63. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in number, 
so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. I could end the video. There it is. I had two videos lately where I got the kinds of comments from believers that said, God is not hateful. God does not delight in destruction. It was with my Nahum video from Thursday where I first kind of made this, isn't it weird that God isn't more sorrowful when he has to punish? And then also in my response to the Super Bowl ad where Jesus is portrayed as nothing but pure love that he gets us, that he's the submissive servant there to help us. Well, verses like this would say, no. And this is about his chosen people group. So despite the earlier verses I read, just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in number, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. It doesn't get any more clear. Honestly, I should stop the video, but I'm going to back this up with a bunch more. How about Psalm 58:10? The righteous will be glad when they are avenged, when they dip their feet in the blood of the wicked. Now, we can put an asterisk next to this one because this is just talking about the righteous, not necessarily speaking about the Lord. But is the the Lord not righteous? Are those who are righteous not acting out in the same way and fashion of the Lord? And part of righteousness is not only to have to recognize in the Bible that wickedness has to be dealt with, but it is to be glad when it is avenged, which you could argue isn't horrible. I think there's a whole other conversation here about what the role of punishment should be. A lot of people believe that the role of punishment should be in part to give satisfaction to the victim or the victim's families. We can see this in our court of law. When the death penalty is handed out for an egregious crime, many people cheer. Yes, we got justice. Now, I have some of my own philosophical thoughts on the role of punishment being more for rehabilitation or at worst, separation because some people cannot be helped. But taking joy or gladness as the word is used here, I think is an immature idea about actual justice, specifically with the second part when they dip their feet in the blood of the wicked. And this kind of verbiage is used all over the Bible, even in the New Testament, by the way. Look at the Jesus character in Revelation and tell me it's not the same as Yahweh. This doesn't sound like a God who is sad about the punishment he has to put out. How about Ezekiel 5.13? Thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal when I have spent my fury upon them. Hear that verse, and then hear something like this. I had meant to mention this. Here's like a pretty standard verse about God being a God of punishment, vengeance, and wrath. I will take my vengeance in anger and wrath upon the nations that have not obeyed me, right? A lot of believers would say that's totally fine. These people have disobeyed God or they don't believe in God or they disrespect God or they sin against God and they're non-repentant and thus God has no choice but to do this. Now some of these words, I will take vengeance, that's a reactionary thing that seems kind of petty for God but we could still make a case for it. In anger, fine, you can have justified anger. Many people will point to Jesus flipping over the tables in the temple in the New Testament and wrath which really just means extreme anger essentially upon the nations that have not obeyed me. Okay, and if it were just verses like this, again, normal Brandon would disagree, but the Brandon that is conceding to this point for this video would say, all right. But do you see the difference, like in this verse from Ezekiel? I will vent my fury to satisfy myself, as if God's glory demands such a strong reckoning, as opposed to just justice itself. How do we know when it's the Lord? Because he has spoken in what? In his zeal with the fury that he has spent on them. Fury, zeal, vent, like these are very strong words that portray someone who is mad and angry and who to release that anger has to unleash these words that are typically more with negative connotations. This isn't, oh, man, my heart breaks that I have to do this, but justice demands it and here's the most effective form of punishment. That's the other thing, and I'm not even gonna get to it in this video. We will save this for a second video. Are the punishments even fair? Does he go overboard? We could talk about things like collective punishment or generational curses, or even just the torture, rape, and enslavement versus just taking life. Again, I could really get on board as much as I could in this particular situation with a God that gives life, so yes, he gets to take it away, and he does so like lethal injection, right? Even our wicked societies have understood there is a more humane way when we do deem it necessary to take life to do so. And for an all-powerful God who literally could snap his fingers and the people that needed to be eradicated were done with, he chooses some very barbaric and long-lasting sufferings instead. How is that just? But 
that's its own topic of conversation. Let's get back to the verses here. Leviticus 26, 14 through 16. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all of my commandments and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. I guess this was good timing after what I just said, because bringing on sudden terror and wasting diseases and fevers and these things to just rob these people of their vitality, you might as well just kill them then. But it sounds like he's delighting here in the fear and harm and suffering that he gets to instill. So I think that's maybe an important question for the believer in terms of how you conceive of your God. If you believe that God does have to enact punishment, do you think that it should be just the loss of life that he has given them since they are abusing it against his covenant? Or is he justified in causing suffering? And does the suffering really pay the penalty? Or is it just a way for God to enjoy inflicting pain like any other horrific ruler of the past? We see it everywhere, this idea that I'm going to mistreat you so bad that you will beg for death, that death becomes the sweet release. This is usually in like movie lines where we're talking about psychopaths that have captured and plan to torture individuals as opposed to just killing them or torturing them before they kill them, which Yahweh also does. You can't say it's merciful that he's just torturing them because this lets them off the hook to die if he's still going to kill them later anyways. David's son, who is allowed to be suffering and sick for a week before he dies, is a perfect example, one I've brought up a lot and one that Dark Matter just made an amazing video on. I'll link that in the description as well. Okay, let's keep going. Isaiah 63, three through six. I have trodden the wine presses alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. This is such a ridiculous vision of God bringing vengeance on the nations around him. Again, trample them in anger and trod them down in wrath does not sound like regretful, sorrowful punishment. It just doesn't. How about Ezekiel 25, 17? I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. They will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. Again, this exaggeratory, hyped up language that just shows a God that seems to enjoy a measure of suffering that is so great that it proves who he is. Going back to Deut 32, 41, when I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. You could make the case at the beginning, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's imagery. We're seeing that this God is using tools of destruction to do so in a metaphorical or symbolizing way. Fine. But let's look at the end of the verse here. I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay them who hate me. Adversaries enemies, those who hate me. Oftentimes, Christians try to portray this God and his punishment as a good father. He loves everyone. He desires that none should perish. He had a plan for everyone. You know, God came to save the whole world. This God sacrificed himself to save humanity. But we have this God telling us a different story. He has enemies. He has adversaries. He's not thinking of them as children. The only time we get metaphorical language about children in the Old Testament from God is for his chosen people group, and still he treats them like this. But this verse, of course, talking about the nations around Israel, they're his enemies. They're his adversaries. He's not sad about wiping them out. It's part of his plan. I feel obligated to once again point out my Gentiles video, made them just to hate them. You're probably sick of me doing so, but it fits so well with so many of these topics. All right, let us continue. How about Amos 4.10? I sent plagues among you as I did in Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So confused why this violence isn't getting his end goal. And that's the other thing. Oftentimes, again, the excuse is that he has to. But many times what we actually see, and I'm going to point to one other video, Haggling with God, is that God has these things he likes to do to try to get people's attention. It's not required because we've seen him relent of it after bargaining with one of his prophets. So he doesn't have to do much of this. This is the other thing. It's just hugely important to understand that half of these punishments in the Old Testament are not required by his divine sense of duty and justice. They're or something he is doing to try to win his people back, to get someone's attention, or because he's pissed off at them and petty. And we have an example with this verse, yet you have not returned to me. He was trying to get them back. This is no different than the boyfriend who is terrorizing his girlfriend until she treats him with the respect he believes that he deserves. It's barbaric and it's disgusting and it's inexcusable. How about Ezekiel 28, 22 through 23? This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Sidon, and I will gain glory within you. 
They will know that I am the Lord when I inflict punishment on her and show myself holy within her. So again, we have the personification of a city here that needs to be punished because of their wicked ways, a pattern that we see constantly. And we have God saying, I'm against you, not I am for you and I wish I didn't have to. I am against you. And how will we know again that he's Lord? By his punishments. What if it was by his love? What if it was by his mercy? What if it was by all the things that Christians claim it is instead of in direct opposition to how this God describes himself? It's right here. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This isn't some anonymous account of what maybe this Jesus character said at one point that's obviously been exaggerated and manipulated by fallible man. And this is, via a prophet, exactly what the God of the universe wants to say about himself. That's why I think the Old Testament is so important in understanding the character of God. Let's keep going. Oh, I have a New Testament one that was left in here. I thought I had taken them all out. Let me read it to you. Revelation 18, 6. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. The reason I had this particular verse in here originally was to point out the inconsistency in this God. You know, in the Old Testament, we have a God that says an eye for an eye. And many people contrast that with Jesus's New Testament saying of turn the other cheek. I think there's some validity there. There's also some different understandings about how that verse could be taken. But a double portion, two eyes for one eye, even if punishment has to be doled out, does it have to be this egregious? Again, the case I'm trying to make here is that we have a God that delights in destruction, that punishes with glee, that is boastful about his power and his ability to inflict harm and terror, whose very definition of wisdom is fearing him, again, in contrast to the loving, merciful God that desires that none should perish. So again, those verses are in the Bible, but they're not the only ones, and we should be paying attention to this. Proverbs 1, 26 through 27. I, in turn, will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. Now, this is not God speaking. This is the Lady Wisdom. This is something written by the wisest man that ever lived, is the claim about Solomon. And when he personifies wisdom to say what is right in the world, wisdom herself, which we could also obviously connect to the God of this universe, laughs. What a damning verse this is. And what a horrific example. I've had this quoted at me so many times in the comments when people talk about how I'm so lost and deceived and I'm going to hell and they and their God laugh at me. And you can't say, oh, those are the bad Christians. Those are the trolls. They're quoting scripture, scripture that is attributed to wisdom itself. There's no redeeming this, laughing when distress and trouble overwhelm you. Can you picture someone that is overwhelmed by a horrific situation like a siege on a city that God has orchestrated to punish them, where he promises that it will get so bad and he will allow it to get so bad on purpose so that it may be assigned to those walking by the city, or these people are having to eat their own children because of the starvation that's happening from the siege. Think about that mother in that impossible situation that almost none of us watching this video could ever even fathom. And now picture God in in heaven laughing at how overwhelmed and troubled she is. This is his vengeance. This is it. I know it's hard. It's hard. Even for me, it's hard to imagine that. And yet here it is. And if you're hung up on the fact that this is Lady Wisdom and not God, stick around for the verse at the end. All right. Let's go next to Ezekiel 9, 5 through 6. As I listened, he said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men and women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone that has the mark. This is God speaking to his soldiers. Now there's different ideas about if these were actually angels or if these were soldiers of the city. The prophet was supposed to go around and put a mark on everyone's head that wasn't to be touched, that was to be spared by God. But for the rest of these people, including women and children, what could they have possibly done? And listen to the way in which they're supposed to do this horrific thing without showing pity or compassion. I understand if vengeance has to be done that maybe you can't have pity because pity would actually look like not doing the thing. But God is commanding his counsel one way or another to go and picture it. Kill 
babies, rip them from their mothers, maybe before, maybe after they have just killed this woman, hiding in fear, trying to cover her baby. And this thing, soldier or angel, takes what? A knife, slits the baby's throat, cuts the baby's head off, suffocates the baby to death, smothers it, throws it off the high wall, and is told by God himself, don't you dare do it with compassion. This is the God Christians believe in and serve. And their denial of the fact that this God is like this is without justification because he's bragging about it in his own word. The word that is used for you to know him, for you to quote back at me all of the lovely things that this book also says about this God. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You do not get to enjoy the niceties of this God while simply ignoring the horror. And you can tell me none of this proves that God isn't real? Fine. You're right, but it should prove to you, you have no business claiming this God is good. You have no business claiming this God is perfect or consistent or fair or just. Now, I could make the case further that because it's also mutually exclusive, the particular claims of this particular God actually make this God falsifiable. But I do understand the general thing of, this doesn't disprove God, this just means you don't agree with him. But he doesn't agree with himself. That's my problem. Not that I have some amazing moral standard that I'm holding this God to. According to his own standard, he is a hypocrite hypocritical and evil dictator, period. But okay, do 3242, I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the long haired heads of the enemy. This is God himself speaking. This isn't like Moses giving a pre-battle motivational message. This is how God views justice and punishment. Gross. Isaiah 47, 3. Your nakedness shall be uncovered and your shame shall be seen. That's hard to say. I will take vengeance and I will spare no one. The need to add shame is something that I think is also highly problematic and we could bring up a hundred more verses. In fact, just in Nahum, we have an exact verse like this where he is pulling the personified city's dress up over her face to reveal her nakedness and to shame her. Very similar to what we're seeing here in Isaiah. And it is unnecessary, no? Like, Let's use an example. Let's say we agree that war has to happen and we should have etiquette in war. We should have certain rules for how we conduct ourselves and how we expect the enemy to conduct themselves when it comes to treating prisoners, accepting surrenders, etc. You know, Geneva Convention stuff. Now, not that this is always followed. Obviously, there are people that do horrific things in war. But the very fact we have something on the books that says something like, we shouldn't rape these people. We shouldn't strip them naked to shame them proves that even as a society that still breaks these rules, we are already better off than the God that commands these kinds of things himself. Does no one else see the conflict here? Shame is an unnecessary part of punishment unless it is for your own delight at your victim's expense. Okay, just a couple more. Isaiah 124, therefore the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will get my relief from the enemies and avenge myself on my foes. A-H, ah, a sigh of relief. Once again, just wanting to point out, God does not see us all as his chosen people. He does not see us all as his children, worthy of love and respect, but still needing to be punished. I have a whole nother video coming where we compare God to a typical parent and we see how much he fails. But imagine for one second that I as a parent who do have to discipline and punish my children, did so with any of this kind of verbiage or attitude. Imagine that I laugh at them in their distress. Imagine that I use such heavy and harsh language to describe the terror that I'm going to bring them. Imagine that I strip them so that they feel even more shame and guilt other than whatever we're having to address in the first place. Imagine that I say, you did this to me, so I'm gonna give you a double portion when I give it back to you. Vengeance and punishment are so very different, and yet vengeance gets such a pass in the Bible from these believers. Imagine when I got done punishing them, I said, ah, oh, my relief, finally, relief from my enemies. I have now avenged myself of my foes. That's not love. Okay, two more, and these two I just put to double down on the argument we might get back from the Proverbs one where Lady Wisdom is speaking in personified language, and that is going to be Psalm 37, 13, which is the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. That's delighting in destruction. Or Psalm 2, 4 through 5, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. 
the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. Case closed. That's it. Almost any of these verses would work on their own. And look at them as a collective. Look at what they say about this God. Oh, what a loving, remarkable, slow to anger, merciful God, great father, this entity is. Nope. So that's it. That's all I have for today. I'm very curious to hear your comments on this one. Again, if you like these kinds of episodes where we use so much scripture to refute itself, check out the playlist and make sure that you're caught up. I have a great video for you on Tuesday with another takedown. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you simply enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.